everyone for joining us live and virtual. For those of you live with us today in the kitchen, thank you for coming through this Canadian smog that we currently have. Uh, we really appreciate you and I'm so excited for Caribbean Heritage Month today to introduce such an amazing person of culture, Dominican descent, had to represent with my tres golpes. We'll talk a little bit about that later. But I want to give a quick intro of this amazing woman, Vanessa Mota, that I have next to me. I had to read from the notes to make sure I get all the accolades correct. Vanessa Mota is an award-winning food photographer and content creator. Her love for food led her to create My Dominican Kitchen, a bilingual blog sharing traditional Dominican recipes and Latin-inspired meals for home cooks. She was born in Santo Domingo, the capital of Dominican Republic, and grew up in a... I had to practice this word. <laughs> Spanish is my first language. Uh, may, may, matriarchal household surrounded by amazing cooks. Her interest in food began as a child visiting the farmer's market with her mom and watching her grandmother and aunts cook delicious traditional Dominican meals. But it wasn't until adulthood that Vanessa learned how to cook while pregnant with her first child living in New York City and missing her family's home cooking. She started her blog as a way to preserve her family's recipe and share with the world the flavors of La Comida Criolla, Creole food. She has been recognized as a top food photographer and creator by Hispanicize Blog Her and Mom 2.0. She is also a member of the 2021 fall class of Cafe Media's Remarkable Voices. Without further ado, Vanessa Mota. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and um, share with everyone one of my favorite recipes. Um, and that is so easy to make that anyone can make it like as soon as you go home. <laughs> Listen, we love easiness for our family, our moms, our dads, anyone who wants to cook, for lazy people like me who just want to order out <laughs> because it's easier. So I feel that having something easy that you can make at home is always a nice little reminder of your culture. I, you know, I always tell people it's, it's interesting because a lot of people think that Dominican food is very involved and very difficult because when you, when I grew up, my grandparents, my grandma and my aunts and everyone used to like take the long way <laughs> to make a recipe. Um, but of course, you know, they use the tools that they had. Um, but for me, you know, people always say like, oh, you know, you must love to cook and all of that. And I'm like, not really. <laughs> I actually like to eat a lot and I really enjoy my Dominican food. So I had to find ways to kind of like make it easy and quick so that I could keep eating the foods that I learned um, that I ate when I was a child. Um, but, you know, in this lifestyle that we don't have time to spend like three hours boiling beans, right? Like we don't do that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting to, to be able to share like how you can make really flavorful Dominican dishes without like spending all day in the kitchen. My first question about a Dominican cookbook was, how did you find what a half a cup is, a quarter of a cup is with the, oh, just it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Like, oh no, just you just put a little bit of this. Okay, but what's a little bit? So what's how, little, how did yes. you translate a little bit into actual measurements to create recipes in a cookbook? Yeah, so I always share this story and this is the reason why I wanted to write a cookbook because, um, you know, in our culture, people don't, really measure recipes. They cook everything by eye. By the, by, an the, know, the, the, the ancestors. The ancestors <laughs> screaming in your ear, stop, right? <laughs> um, but when you're learning how to, how to cook, it's really hard to kind of like follow, you know, those steps and, and those instructions. And, you know, as you mentioned, um, I learned how to cook at an older age when I was pregnant with my daughter. I didn't know how to cook anything. Um, and I was living in, in Long Island, which is far. <laughs> far <laughs> away from all of my family and I had to call them and be like how do I make this and then their instructions is like oh, well you add a little bit of oregano and you add a little bit of sazon and you know adobo and I'm like but what does that mean like what is a little bit right <laughs> like it's really hard for you for someone that has never cooked a dish before to be able to cook a good a, a good recipe with those instructions um, so I went through a lot of trial and error <laughs> a lot uh, and I started you know kind of like getting my feel around the kitchen 
um, making a lot of mistakes and, and, and tasting and learning. But then I saw that there was really a, a need because if, if I was struggling so much, there, there must be other people also struggling with the same issue. So I bought myself my little measuring cups and my measuring spoons and I said, I'm going to measure everything and I'm going to write it down. The fact that you had to buy them just tells enough that I you know. cook with, <laughs> with the whispers of the ancestors. Yes. Well, I, I had to try it a lot because I, you know, I, I'm adding salt. Okay, I'm adding salt. I don't know how much salt, but I'm going to keep tasting until I get it right. Um, and the dishes didn't always come out right until they did, right? Because you kind of like start getting the feel of it. Uh, but then, yeah, then I started measuring everything and then I started kind of like understanding how much of what to put into a certain amount of something, right? Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, and with that under understanding, then I started measuring things, developing recipes, writing them down step by step with all of their measurements. And I started my website. And, you know, my website started growing and people, you know, were really loving the recipes and continue to make the same comment. Like, you know, I love that you're writing the recipes because my mom never told me, like, how much it goes into something. And, and you know, for me, like, that was important. Um, and then it came the time where I wanted to kind of, like, expand in my cooking skills and I couldn't find Dominican cookbooks. And I kept waiting and I kept searching and I kept waiting and searching and there was an any and then I just I guess I'm gonna have to write it myself so that's right we love that's what I did <laughs> we love an active queen <laughs> so I that's what I did and I did it out of really love for like my my cultural food um and because I have two kids who are teenagers and I am aware that at one point they're going to leave my house and they're going to find themselves in the same situation where they're going to want to taste the food or eat the foods that I, you know, made for them and they're not going to know how to make it. So guess what? Now they have a book <laughs> <laughs> and they can make it. Two things that really stood out to me in the cookbook is the authenticity of the food. Even being from New York with a big Caribbean culture, a big Dominican culture, I feel like a lot of time the conversation of food is very stylus to like tres golpe, like mangu and fried cheese and salami or like mofongo or, ri or rice, beans and chicken or pelin. But I love that you had, for example, morisoñando, which is usually orange juice with milk, which sounds so weird when you have it and taste so it, good. but it's so good. And morisoñando translates to die dreaming. Mm -hmm. But there are different ways that you can make it that is not just with orange juice. I have and, three recipes yeah, in the book. <laughs> and to me, that was so authentic because as someone who, for me, I've traveled to the Dominican Republic my whole life with my grandmother, aunts, uncles, and all of that, all the cooking, similar background and cultural aspect there, I've had morisoñando with with lime juice instead of orange juice or with passion fruit juice. So that to me was just like, oh no, you get it. Like the yes. fact that you have this, like, oh yeah, you get it. Yeah. So I wanted to really, I want, I wanted the book to be really authentic, to stick to kind of like our traditional foods, right? The meals that we have a home that you know that my grandmother and my mom made and my aunts like the actual recipes that we cook every day and have for lunch or dinner um i didn't want it to be um too fancy i wanted to be close right like i wanted people to see the book see the recipe see the picture and say oh yeah this i can actually make right like it's it's really a um a home style type of book where all of the recipes are like recipes that anyone who is Dominican can recognize and be like, oh, I know that, you know, um, that dish, um, because I wanted it to stay authentic to those. I wanted to preserve those recipes, the recipes that everyone knows, that everyone loves. Um, and I, they're really simple and straightforward. They're not even yeah. out of the box. Um, and Morisoñando is like one of those recipes that, yes, people know it as, you know, milk and, and um, orange juice. But in the Dominican Republic, we have so many ways in which you make it, like you said. And I wanted to include like a variety of that so that people see and understand it's not just one recipe. You mm -hmm. can make so many. And by the way, like, have you tasted with bitter orange? No. Oh, that's a, that will be in the next book. <laughs> The that, next one. So that was actually going to be my other question, is that the book is in English. Yes. Can you drive, give us a little bit of your thought process of mm -hmm. even though your blog is bilingual, coming out with an English-only cookbook? Well, there weren't any. There weren't any. Um, and for, for us, like, out in the diaspora, like, uh, 
the new generations are growing up in this country kind of like losing our recipes. You know, they speak English. They are not going to be standing next to like mom, be like, <laughs> what you're doing? How do you make this? Right? Like, because mm -hmm. that's literally how, how people learn. Yeah. Uh, but our kids are not doing that. And, and for me, like I started seeing, especially like with my own kids and their friends, right? Um, that that aspect of Dominican food and Dominican cooking was getting lost. Um, and I, it, it kind of like hurt my heart a little bit because I know how, um, how important Dominican food is to our own culture, right? Like it's a huge part of like Dominican culture. And to the Caribbean. Exactly, to um, the point where like plantains are emblem of like Dominicanidad, right? Like you know that um, that's like the symbol <laughs> <laughs> of how Dominican you are. Um, so for me, it was important that the book was in a language that our kids understand, that, um, you know, the next generations are going to see and be able to follow it and, and make the recipes um, and that then they can take it and pass it along to their kids, right? I don't want my book to be just something that is lost in a bookshelf mm -hmm. somewhere. I want it to be kind of like this heirloom that I give to my kids and that my kids give to their kids and that their kids follow, you know, so that we can preserve those recipes mm -hmm. and maintain it because, yeah, our kids um, outside of the country are, are not... Um, are not really like interested in being in the kitchen watching me cook. So <laughs> um, I, I wanted them to have something that um, that they could like keep for for themselves. I love that. Yeah. And it's a, English is kind of like the universal language. So I know that there is such a huge population. That's why I put it in quotes. It's yes. like, eh. but depending on who you ask, but for all of those people that maybe are living in Europe, Exactly. Also, yeah. having access to that, that a lot of times when we talk about the Dominican migration, we focus yes. in the U.S., but there's such a population of our people that are in Europe. Yeah. We're worldwide. I went to Iceland and met a Dominican person. <laughs> We're everywhere. <laughs> We're everywhere. We, we, uh, that is true. We are everywhere. And, and that has become more evident to me um, after I launched the book because I've had people message me from London. Um, and not Dominican people, by the way, because by the way, my book, and this is also something that's really cool. Like I made it trying to uh, preserve our recipes and, and pass them down to the next generation, right? Especially for us in the diaspora, but it, it, it's also been reaching so many people um, that just love the Dominican Republic. People that like to go to the Dominican Republic and enjoy the food and enjoy the people. People who are not um, Dominican, but are married to a Dominican person and have mm -hmm. multicultural children. You know, they want to have something like this to be able to teach their kids about part of their um, roots, right? And, and, and their background. And for me, that has been very fulfilling um, and, and exciting to see. Right? That it's not just yeah. like me here <laughs> being like, yes, this book is important. Like, no, a lot of people mm -hmm. actually think that the, the, you know, that it is important. Absolutely. Yeah. One more question before we get into the demonstration. I want to leave room for question and answer for the people that are in the room. I'm not sure if we're able to do virtual questions. No, I'm sorry. Sorry, guys, if you're watching virtually. <laughs> but for those in the room, um, with putting all of this on paper, putting your name to it, it becomes very much a representation of like, here's Dominican cooking. For you, it's my representation or my way of doing it. Right. But a lot of times, even though it's from your perspective, it can be seen as this is the way, especially as the only or one of the only books that are in English. Mm -hmm. Before publishing, was there any hesitation of fear of getting feedback that was more like, my mom does it this way, or that's not the correct way? Because you can ask three people, five people in a room how they make something, and they all do it a little differently. Yeah, so, you know, recipes are art, really. And they're open to interpretation, right, and what people like and what people enjoy. Um, like you said, this is how I cook my recipes, right? And I've been lucky enough to have a lot of people tell me that my recipes taste really good. So I'm like Period. going to own that <laughs> and be like, you know, it might not be how, you know, your family makes it or your mom, but I assure you that this recipe tastes good. So try it. But um, also, you know, yeah, there's always a certain like little fear of like, how are people going to receive mm -hmm. it? Are people going to um, like it, you know? Oh. But at the same time, you know, I, I have... 
I strongly believe that, you know, everyone has their own way of making a recipe. I mean, I've had debates on Instagram posts that I've done of like how people make habichuelas con dulce. That's and, how you know you, you made know, it when every, people have your comments. That debate is not even with me. They're, they were fighting among themselves. That's how and you I know was like, wow. It. Wow, exactly. I was like, wow, people are really passionate about habichuelas con dulce, which is a dessert made with beans from the Dominican Republic. And, and that was really exciting. Um, but also, you know, I let the debate go on because we all make uh, different decisions in the way that we combine ingredients and how we make it. And I'm highly aware that everyone makes a recipe a different way. But as long as they taste good, it's all good. Amazing. And with that, we want to move forward to the demo demonstration portion for those in the kitchen. You'll have the opportunity to taste the arepitas de yuca or fried yuca fritters. Um, but I will let it to you to demonstrate. We'll ask some questions as you do it, as yes. you demonstrate. And yes, you please. can find this recipe within the cookbook. Yes. So um, arepitas de yuca is one of my favorite recipes. It's actually my daughter's favorite recipe. She will fight you tooth and nail <laughs> for this one. Um, and it's basically yuca which is a root vegetable, right, that um, grows under the ground and we eat a lot in the Caribbean. Um, it's similar to kind of like a potato, um, just a little more starchy. And what we do is that we grate it um, like this. If you're if you're lazy, you can also buy it grated Grate it, in, the, yes. in the freezer section. I do of that your local store because I talk <laughs> I talk about <laughs> I talk about I, I, how I cut corners, right? So one thing that I do is that when I don't want to peel and grate this by hand, I do buy it buy it frozen, already grated. Um, sometimes they don't have it grated. Sometimes it will be like peeled and frozen the chunks, and then you can grate it in the food processor. Um, and the fresh one as well, you can grate it in the food processor and that way you don't have to kind of like do it by hand. But, you know, our ancestors, they were the <laughs> ones kind of like doing by hand and that will save you so much time. Um, and basically what we do is we, we add certain ingredients to our flavor um, and so that um, we add an egg so that it binds and we fry it. I'm going to turn this on first. There so, we go. There we go. Now we got fire. <laughs> okay. So the oil needs to be hot. Um, and what we do is we have the grated yuca and we are going to add salt, butter. Um, the reason I add butter is because it allows for, um, for the fritter to kind of like be a little smoother inside, softer. Uh, we use anise seed, which is uh, a spice that is aromatic and it gives like really nice flavor um to the yuca fritters and then i add a little bit of sugar Ooh. yes and the reason that you add sugar it's also because sometimes the yuca will have a bit of a bitterness to it and the sugar allows to cut that bitterness so when you eat the fritter it won't have any of that um, we add an egg you know, I recently learned that you're not supposed to crack an egg on the surface in which you're cooking because then shells go in. Go in. That you're supposed to crack it on like a separate surface. Oh, interesting. So that's a... I am. I just learned something new. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I crack my. Well, you mean like on top of it? Yeah, like, like actually here, on right? the bowl, yeah. Oh, okay, yes that okay i thought you meant here no no like you, i usually crack things like on the bowls but then i learned through instagram university yeah that you're supposed yeah. to crack it on a separate surface on so a that the little pieces of eggshells don't, don't go, go inside mm -hmm. yes so yes that i i learned a while ago well a little eggshell Just, but, never hurt anyone <laughs> <laughs> that's the beta one <laughs> um and then what i like to add to my fritters so this is good this way right so you will mix it thoroughly just so that everything um, combines and you can literally just fry it like this and that's completely acceptable that's a good fritter recipe already so there you go like five ingredients right but what I like to add um, is cheddar cheese um, and I like to add cheddar cheese because it gives it a nice flavor and um, it adds like a little bit of gooiness and just like you know another level of flavors to the fritter um, to make it I've never had it with better. cheese so have you had um, 
bollitos de yuca, chilitos, yeah. which is like yuca balls. It's another yeah. fried um, little bowl um, that's made with yuca. Some people stuff it with cheese. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of like that, but, a, that, but, but without, thinner. exactly, without making it into a bowl. I'm going to take the stem out. See, I'm learning so much today. <laughs> My mom will be proud. Um, and you can use like you know, any stringy cheese that you like. I like cheddar cheese because it just adds nice flavor, but I've also used mozzarella cheese and it gives it like a nice little gooiness. Um, that tastes really good. As she's making this, are there any questions from anyone? Yes. For those that know how to make it or like, actually I add this. <laughs> No? Yeah. <laughs> no is there anyone from any other culture currently here that has something that's similar, similar to this, but maybe has a different name? I know, I feel like in the Caribbean, there's so much fried things <laughs> and so that many, are similar. Yeah, so many dishes are similar in the Caribbean. Um, I, know, I know for sure that this dish is not unique to the Dominican Republic. Um, but, you know, we... we have a lot of similarities in a lot of the dishes that we make and um it's just the method of like cooking it and preparing it that um that changes so a lot of questions that i get and we were mentioning it before people ask me like what's the difference between mango and mofongo well mango is boiled like you boil the plantains right and then you mash it mango and for those that don't know it's like the way i describe it is like mashed potatoes but with green plantains with green plantains yes and then mofongo is that you fry the plantains and then you mash it, right? And you add like a little garlic to give it a little more flavor. But it's essentially the same thing. It's plantains. Cooked plantains and mashed. Tastes different because of the way that you prepare it. What's your favorite recipe from the cookbook? <laughs> That's hard. I don't like this question. Because I like different recipes for different occasions, right? Okay, fair. Things. But I will say that my favorite recipe is sancocho. It's, it's that one dish. It, I know he laughs because it's everybody's favorite dish. It's like, if you, and it's, I, it's my favorite. It was like the first dish that I actually learned how to make well. Um, Jesus, okay, that's how you know you're good top notch. There's, okay, so there's a levels to Dominican cooking. There's like fritters, there's like white rice, there's like chicken. Sancocho is like the beef. up there, right? It's like final round. <laughs> Like Street Fighter, Street Fighter, like that it's like win. a label of love. There is no one that could make sancocho that didn't spend minimum like three hours. I don't think exactly. <laughs> so I will tell you, I because sancocho was my my favorite. It is one of the favorite uh, first recipes that I learned how to make, um, and I didn't learn it right away. Right, like I had to do a lot of trial and error, try different things. You know, I started mixing and. Um, combining methods from like my mom and my abuela and my aunts um, until I got like my own style and recipe with a little bit of something from each one of them, right? And it it is being so we just okay. Look, let me finish my thought and then I'll tell you what I'm doing. Um, it's um, it's been my favorite dish since forever. So what I what I did is that I really wanted to get that recipe down because mm -hmm. I really, really love it. And I can tell you that it, I became so good at it that now I can make a sancocho in like less than two hours. And yes, I almost gave myself a price <laughs> on that you because <laughs> I, I could not believe that I, I was able to do that. And the recipes in the cookbook, my famous okay. sancocho, which is also my son's favorite dish. So that's good. Um, so what I'm doing with the fritters after I combine everything is that I take like spoonsfuls of the mixture and I literally just drop it in the oil and let it fry. So what it's going to do is going to fry for about three to four minutes. Um, and you want to just let it fry until like it's nice and golden and, and cook through. Um, it's gonna turn crispy on the outside and it'd be like nice and yummy and gooey on the inside. And it's going to just be such a nice bite. I love things that are crunchy. And then when you buy into it that are like nice and soft on the inside, it's super good. You also want to make sure that the oil is hot because you want that crispiness, right? And if you, um, if you add the, the mixture in a cold oil, it's just going to soak up the oil. 
and it's not going to it's not going to get that crispiness and then you know after a while of course it's going to fry it's going to get crispy but when you bite into it it's going to be too oily inside what was the recipe that you included that was like i don't really like this but i feel like i should include it for authenticity purposes <laughs> mondongo really ah, i thought i was gonna get that people <laughs> like people love tripe so mondongo is a tripe stew um and it's literally that it's pork um tripe uh made into a stew and in the dominican republic it's really like it's a huge dish people love it um it, it and it's made really well right and it's really and it's really mm -hmm. good i just i can't <laughs> I can't do the tripe. My mom loves it. She she is obsessed with it. Um, I just I can't get past the idea that it's tripe. So I I don't eat it. I know how to make it. I will cook it for you, um, and cook it well. But I will not I will not eat it. Meanwhile, all my dad's birthdays growing up, instead of having like oh like a buffet, it was like a mondongala. Oh. It was literally mondongo was the star dish. Was the star dish? <laughs> yes, people love it. People really, really love it in the Dominican Republic. It's it's I. It's one of those dishes that be, that is really like, um, it's like sancocho. Yeah, it's one of those dishes that is like sancocho, and it's also like involved, and you know you have to kind of like clean it well and make it well, and it's all. People love it. I just, I can't get past it. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, I have a question. I love Dominican food. I'm not Dominican, and I order it a lot. Do you have, like, any recommendations for, like, a beginner-friendly recipe or something? I'm just, so for those that are watching virtually, the question was for someone who really likes Dominican food and enjoys ordering and eating it, but wants to learn how to make it, what's a good beginner-friendly recipe? Beginner friendly recipe. Well, this I, one. Yeah. Well, <laughs> this is perfect because it's super easy. But really, if you want a meal, what I will recommend is to try a locrio. Locrio is rice mixed with a meat, some type of protein. So it's, you know, how we cook the seasoned rice. We add all the seasonings and it's like yellow. Um, but we also like mix it in with some type of meat. Um, we call it locrio to just um, the whole dish. Like the idea when you say a locrio, it's like you know that it's rice with some type of protein. And you can make it with Dominican salami, uh, which is like a type of sausage that is super easy to use. You can make it with longanisa, uh, which is Dominican sausage, but like the links, you know. <laughs> it's two different types of Dominican sausage. Um, you can make it with uh, pork meat, chicken, and we also make it with uh, sardines, spicy sardines. So pica pica, we call it. It comes in a, in a can and it's, um, it comes like in a spicy sauce. Um, and it's the, it's the same process. Uh, I have multiple recipes for Logrio in the book, but it's really simple. It's literally, um, you know, let's say you're gonna make longanisa. You're gonna cut the longanisa in, you know, a small one inch pieces. You're gonna fry it, take it out. Um, you're going to then add the seasonings for the rice, add the rice, water, and then add the longanis on top, cover it, let the rice cook. And that's it. That's literally like a, the whole dish. And it's not complicated at all, but it's delicious. And, and it's going, you serve it with like a side salad, a slice of avocado, and that's something, a very authentic Dominican food for you. <laughs> Passing, I'm gonna. Uh, the lady over here also had a question. As a Dominican myself, I'm super orgullosa that this book is out there, so I commend you for that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Deserves praise. Um, and I also liked how you phrased that the book was um, a family heirloom for your children and the future generations of your family. I often think of recipes as like love letters of gratitude for all of those that you know cooked before us. And I was super curious to see or hear if there's a recipe that's like super nostalgic that you kind of had a struggle to like replicate. And I think for me as I'm almost turning 30, so it's my turn to figure out my own recipes. <laughs> and for me, it's Johnny Keke, that's hard to do, or um, Chofan. So I'm curious if you had something similar. Aw, yeah, Chofan is wonderful. Chofan, by the way, is Dominican fried rice. So if you don't know, in the Dominican Republic, we have a big uh, Chinese population. 
and we have a lot of our dishes have kind of like we have taken a little bit of uh, their culture and their dishes and have Dominicanized it a little bit and make it into our own. Um, so Chofan is one of those dishes. It's really good. So for me, um, the dish that I think that really touches my heart a lot, it, I'm, I'm going to say, I have to say, is conconetes. Um, and these are like, it's a rustic cookie um, made with coconut. Uh, it's also called masitas, and the reason the reason um, it's a bit it, it, it touches my heart is because it's a multi generational recipe um, that was my um, my great grandmother's recipe, mm -hmm. and she taught it to her daughter, and then her daughter taught her to my aunt, and it's a recipe that they made and they used to sell it to colmados. Um, and then the uh, which are Dominican bodegas, bodegas, right? <laughs> like the the grocery store, basically. So my family, my aunt um, and her aunt, they used to make them in bulk, sell it to the colmados, and and then the colmados will sell it for a profit, right? And the recipe is always one that every time the recipe is mentioned, um, my entire family goes like, "Oh, y lo con conete de tía Consuelo," <laughs> you know, kind of like it has that um, nostalgic thing to it. And my aunt, actually, she came to visit me one time when I was working in the, for, uh, on the cookbook uh, for Thanksgiving. We were having Thanksgiving at my house. And she literally just got up and said, I'm going to make you, I'm going to uh, teach you how to make conconetes. So go and buy these things um, and we're going to make it right now. And I'm like, are you serious? You're going to teach me how to make conconetes? <laughs> and she was like, yeah, yes, I'm going to teach you. And she literally during, we were preparing Thanksgiving dinner and she just, told me right there and, and allow me, <laughs> which is interesting, she allowed me to measure everything before she added <laughs> anything to anything. Um, she allowed me to measure everything and, and, and write it down so that I could have the recipe in my cookbook. So for me, that was, um, it was very touching and it was nice. It, it made me feel like, you know, I was recording something that was important to my family. And um, yeah, that was a nice, a nice, a nice thing. For me are you now the designated cook for everything no. where it's like <laughs> i'm not doing it you could do it oh she already knows how to do it i don't want to <laughs> no actually it, you know it's 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 interesting but there's a lot um there are really great cooks in my family um especially in the dominican republic and we have a lot of them who actually enjoy cooking so they they handle the kitchen they love it they you know and um I've in this book, I've included a lot of the recipes, you know, thankfully, I have a, a fantastic family that um, I literally just send them WhatsApp messages. <laughs> How do you make this? And then, you know, of course, in their instructions, oh, well, you add this and you add that. And, you know, and I will take what they told me and then go and try to measure everything right and and make it work for the recipe. Um, but I am 100 percent aware that my book will not have been possible if I didn't have my my family um, walk me through a lot of those recipes. and. Yeah, they are the cooks. I'm, I'm not. I like to eat. I go for the food. <laughs> I think that's so representative of so much of Caribbean culture and just diaspora culture, which is eating, uh, like eating, cooking, meaning that that's how you spend time with each other, how you learn, how you show your love. Like maybe no, they will tell you I love you. You'll be like, did you eat? Did you eat? <laughs> yes. Do you eat? Come see here. Let yeah. me feed you. That's how they show love. Uh, really, yes. I think you had a question. That. So my question is about uh, pasta and hoja. So you've talked about how some dishes take a long time. Uh, Adi pizza take a long time of all the grinding. But uh, sancocho of all the uh, prep work with maize. Uh, sancocho can, uh, sorry, pasta hoja can also take a long time. So I have a question like, does your book share cheat codes also for making pasta and hoja? Do you have how many variants that you have in your book? Um. Pastel en hoja Pas is pastel another. Pastel en hojas is another. Yeah, so <laughs> yes, of course I have cheat codes. Uh, like before, like I mentioned before, pastel en hojas um, is a mix of plantains and yautia, which is another uh, root uh, vegetable, and um, auyama. Um, and in, in our culture, the way that it's traditionally made is that people grate all of those ingredients, right? And then they season it and, and make it into um the pastel uh what i do to sh to cut time is i grate everything in the food processor 
so everything combines really quickly. I seasoned everything. And then really the only thing that takes a little bit more time is the folding, right? Like the putting it together. And I don't really think about that as like too much effort because it's really, it, you know, if you think about it, pastel en hojas is like a holiday dish. It's something that you make when family come together to kind of like, and it's about enjoying the process of like cooking these meals together to then enjoy it later and celebrate the holidays. Um, so for me, the the wrapping part of it is is kind of like the joy of it um and she'll take time right it should take a little bit of time for you to kind of like connect with those helping you um go through that process uh so that's 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 really what i do um and i love pastel and hojas but also you know making the filling ahead the day before helps with like cutting down on the the time to cook it um so yeah for those that don't know what pasteles and hojas are, it's similar to tamat, to like tamales, tamales. from Mexico. Um, I think that tamales are with corn, like the corn leaf mm -hmm. that they're wrapped. Where patelenosa is with the plantain, with a, yeah, plantain leaf. And I think that the masa that is used is a little bit different of ingredient because I think tamales is also corn. Oh, it's, it's completely different. Yeah, yeah. it's corn. So, but the idea corn. of like a like a filled masa that's wrapped and boiled and filled and, with something and filled in something. So it's a similar like thought process, just like different ingredients. Different ingredients, and, yeah. exactly. Like I said, uh, you know, Caribbean and Latin food has a lot of similarities. Um, and uh, most of the difference is going to be in the cooking process, right? Uh, the ingredients that you use and how you make the dish um, is what is what literally like sets these dishes apart. Just different ancestors speaking to you while you make it. While you make it, yes. <laughs> Um, in the meantime, while Vanessa finishes this batch, for those of us that are in the kitchen, please feel free yes, to you can try. to taste the fritters. They were made using, of course, her recipe. So same thing, just made a little bit ahead of time so that we had enough time for this, uh, for this segment. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be, please. Give it a try. I have a question about uh beans because beans is like so big in latin america and everybody has their way to do it and i'm also entering my cooking phase so i'm learning to make sancocho with my mom's recipe uh but i feel like i haven't found the right way to make like really good beans and i can recall from growing up also close to the dominican community their beans are great so i wanted to hear from you and what would you say it's your secret to making beans Oh, you know, beans are so, for me, right? I find that it's, once you get the trick to it, it's the simplest dish to make, right? I'm going to tell you the truth. I am not above canned beans. <laughs> I am not. Because, you know, when you buy the, the dry beans, it actually takes a while for them to boil, to soften off so that you can actually then cook it into, um, into the actual dish. And what I do is I literally just use these, the same seasonings that um, are representative of like the Dominican flavors. So I use like good Dominican oregano, um, cilantro, adobo, uh, bija, which is um, achiote, anato. Um, uh, what do I add? Tomato sauce, black pepper. Um, and something that I realized recently that not a, not a lot of people do, but I do, and I realized because someone commented on one of my videos that like, what is that? I add olives to my beans. So I add like a tablespoon of um, olives or alcaparrado, which is a mixture of capers and, and olives. I'm um, impressed by you knowing all the names of ingredients in like both languages. Because I struggle so much with like uh, the thing that's kind of this the, the, color, yeah. similar to that. I, I'm gonna <laughs> tell you a little, a little secret. What I think, what helped me is actually writing the book. Mm -hmm. Helps me remember a lot of the things, but also uh, I'm not above that. I forget my words uh, because Spanish is my native language, but I came to this country when I was in high school. So I've had to kind of like learn a lot of English and I feel like I forget my words in both languages sometimes. <laughs> and I'm like, what's that word? What's that word? Um, and, and I have to kind of like search for it. But yes, with ingredients for me, it's, it, it's easy. Yeah? Yeah. With ingredients, I, you know, sometimes I forget them, but, you know, it will come uh, quickly to me. How do you say aoyama? 
Aoyama is squash. Oh. So, yeah. <laughs> Aoyama is pumpkin. It's a type of pumpkin, squash. And the one that we traditionally use in the Dominican Republic is the kabocha squash, um, which is a, is a type of squash. That's all I can say. Listen, I've, I did not know how to say that word. I definitely Googled it. And I was like, but this is not what it is. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a type of squash. And, and there's many different types of squash, right? So yeah. you have to know to get the, the right one. The right one. So that I needed to find out, like, which one is the one. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's a good one. So for the, for the beans, to come back to your question, just use the, right, the seasonings that you enjoy, right? Like, and, and make sure that you add enough seasoning. Sometimes what I find is that when you, when you find that the, the flavors are not there yet, it's because you're not adding enough seasoning. So don't be afraid to add things in there. Okay. Okay. For, so sorry, that just means, for those that um, are virtually, the question was, okay, got the ingredients, but how do I get the consistency, the consistency so that it's more on the creamy side and not on the watery side? Mm -hmm. So with that, um, you can let let it boil more to, so that it reduces more. You can take part of the, like part of the beans, not a lot, some of them, um, like let's say half a cup, and you can uh, mash them and pour it, pour it back in into the pot or like um, process it, put it back in into the pot and that's gonna help thicken up a little bit. Yeah, or even like what I do sometimes is that I take my spoon and I, I press them to the side of the pot um, to break them up a little bit and that helps the broth thicken up a, uh, a little bit. But literally like when you find that, um, I, I figure that all you have to do is let the liquid reduce a bit more. You're like this weekend making my yes, beans. Making my beans. <laughs> we have another question. Just a quick question. Um, I love that your family was so open to give you recipes, and you sound like my tia. Tia so fast. That's so easy, right? Everything is easy. <laughs> but for some of us who have um, gatekeepers in our families. They are amazing cooks, but yeah. they do not spill the beans on the recipe. On the recipe. All puns intended. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. How do we encourage them to give us these like love letters, right? So that our future generations can enjoy and we can live through their legacy. Well, you can, you can explain exactly that, right? Like, you know, explain that, you know, we, we want to be able to preserve these recipes because otherwise they're going to get lost. What's going to happen? So your delicious sancocho after you are no longer here with us if you're not gonna willing to share the recipe right um don't you want like your kids and your grandchildren to continue to make that excellent dish um i find that when you approach it from from that area you know a lot of people are going to be more open and more receptive to it i mean come on my mom my mom was always my mom is very impatient she's the type of person that when she's when she's going to cook, she has to cook, and that's it. And when I explained to her what I wanted to do um, with this book and why I wanted to do it, she was my biggest helper. She came, um, She, my mom is retired, she lives in the Dominican Republic, and she literally came Goals. and stayed, I know, <laughs> <laughs> I know, I tell her that all the time. Um, she literally came and stayed with me for like four months to help me, um, work on the cookbook and she literally i will tell her i need to make um i need this recipe and she will get in the kitchen with me and she will allow me to pull out my measuring spoons and my measuring cups and i'll be like don't add anything anywhere until i have measured it okay and i'm gonna use this and you're gonna tell me when to stop and she will be like ah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to, I have in Spanish, of course, like, I have to wait for you to do that. Oh my God, oh my God. And then she'll be like, okay, come on, come on, quickly, quickly, because I got to do this quickly. <laughs> but she was very, you know, she exercised her patience with me so that I could do that. And she literally, like a lot of the recipes in my book are my mom's recipes that she learned from her mom. And she literally just told me, okay, you're going to measure this and we're going to add the salt now. And I'm like, okay, so which spoon do I use? And she'll look at it and be like, this one. And then I'd be like, okay, that's it. Is that enough? And then she'd be like, eh, add a little more, <laughs> right? And I would like be writing everything down and measuring everything down. But, you know, this book was really a labor of love um, for our, our, 
our culture and our food, but also I realized like it was like, um, in a sense, my family's showing me love mm -hmm. because they understood how important this was for me and they were able to kind of like put aside their, you know, stuff to kind of like help me um, move through this book and, and, and get it written and, and do all of that. So I say that because I, I imagine like if you express it from that point of view, they will be more open to to sharing those recipes, you know. Maybe right now they're gatekeepers. They're like, you just want to copy me. You want to take my recipe. <laughs> you want to take my glory. Um, but no, like kind of like explaining to them. It's not about that. It's about, you know, how can we keep this in the family for, you know, for the future and for forever, right? Food um, and cooking food is also such a source of pride. Yes. You know, you take pride in saying that if I want, if someone's craving something, they come to me for that recipe or they come to me to do it because no one does it like me. Like me, mm -hmm. yes. So I feel like, especially in our culture, there's a very much sense of pride that it's like the matriarch of the family that cooks this meal mm -hmm. or does this. And there you go. I know I used to go to my grandmother being like, Mama, can you make me some of this? <laughs> It's like, okay, mi niña. <laughs> yes. I, I take a lot of pride in my Sancocho, I'm going to tell you that. And, and my, my, my kids love to blow me up because we, <laughs> we went to the Dominican Republic on vacation in like 2019. And you know when you get there, everybody receives you with a Sancocho. And we literally went at, to like multiple family members. And we literally, in like a span of a week, we had Sancocho like four times <laughs> at different homes, right? But it's great because everybody makes it different. Everybody has their own their own way of doing mm -hmm. it um and after the whole trip we came back and my kids were raiding everybody sancocho and they they came to me and they said we still think yours is the best yes <laughs> smart kids. i don't know if that was true but it made me feel good for sure from a personal side, you've talked about how this was a labor of love within your family, how it's a labor of love for your kids and your community. When you see this tangible book in your hands, you start a blog and it's something, but we know that digitally it's one thing, but to see this with the picture of your family in it, recipes that take you back to certain places, like did you shed a thug tear? Oh yeah, I cried. <laughs> I cried. Yes, I I was beside myself. I I it felt like a huge accomplishment, and I was I was really filled with emotion because um, sometimes there are things that you maybe have in your heart that you don't really think that you could create mm -hmm. um, or that they can come to life or come to fruition, and this was one of them for me. And when I actually saw the book and, and was able to touch it and feel it, and, and I saw my pictures in there and my recipes, um, yeah, it was very emotional and, and, and it made me, very, made me feel very proud. You should. Um, especially when I saw my kids' faces when they saw it. That really tugged on my heart a little bit and I was like, wow. Um, because at the end of the day, you know, everything we do, we do for our kids and to see them be proud of something that I did, um, was very fulfilling for me. That's amazing. We're so lucky that you had the initiative to do that. Can you tell us a little bit about the transition from a blog to then deciding to write a book and then the process of getting it published? I feel that a lot of times we have like side hustles at, that we're like, oh, this could be something big, but it's like, how do I start? And mm -hmm. you being kind of the only one that's like, okay, I'm doing this. Yeah. Where did you decide to start in the process or start your research on how to accomplish that goal? Uh, I started asking friends. So mm -hmm. I have, um, I have, I've, I've been in, in the blogging business for many years. I started my blog in 2014. Um, and I've made a lot of friends in the industry, um, and many of them had written cookbooks. So I, I asked them what, you know, I, I literally told them, I have this idea. Um, I would like to write a Dominican cookbook. And I asked them what was their process? What did they have to do? How did they get their cookbook deal? Um, how, how did they go about writing the book? Um, all of those questions and and they were all so helpful and supported it kind of like gave me an idea 
Um, and it gave me this thought of like, oh, maybe I can do this, right? If they did it, I can do it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have this amazing blogger friend who, Meli from Mexico in my kitchen, who had in 2020 published her, her cookbook, uh, The Mexican Home Kitchen. And she literally said, I'll introduce you to my editor. And I was yes, like, really? we and love that. We that love supportive, was, supportive. Exactly, yes, the supportive community. Yeah. She literally introduced me to her editor and I pitched my idea to, to them and they loved it and they offered me a cookbook deal. So for me, it, the ease with which everything happened um, just felt like it was meant to be. Because I know not everybody um, goes through the same process. Sometimes it's a little bit harder um, for people. And it, it for me, it just felt like, okay, maybe this is meant to be, and I am meant to be the person to do this. So that kind of like gave me a little bit more confidence and to also like see that other people believe in, in me and the idea that I had and the project um, gave me that little boost of like, okay, maybe I can do this. So yeah, that's, that's how we started. <laughs> we love Latinas supporting Latinas. We yes. have two more questions before we have to wrap up. I have one question over here. My question is about Dominican fusion food. Uh, it makes food becoming more popular. There's a lot more cross-cultural encounters. You mentioned Jovan. Some of us are Dominican fusions. Uh, do you have any Dominican fusion recipes in the book? Is that the next book? Or Oh, the next book. We're already on book number two here. <laughs> I'm still recovering from the first one. but um, I would love, so first, I would love for this book to be in Spanish. Um, I've had a lot of people ask me, um, you know, if the book is in Spanish, if it will be published in Spanish. Um, so that's the goal first. Like, I, I, I want to see if we can make that happen. Um, and a second cookbook, I, I am open to the idea. There's so many recipes that are still not a part of this book, right? Because there's only so much that you can include. Um, and Dominican food is so rich that... Um, yeah, we can have two and three and four and five. And We're building you an empire already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> chef Gordon who is Chef Panet Vanessa Mota. <laughs> I just like to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and we have our last question. How do we know we're done with the arepitas? <laughs> oh, how do we know we're done with the arepitas? Oh, okay. So... <laughs> I'm sorry. I've been cooking them and I'm already done with them. And so basically, you're going to, they cook really fast. They cook about three to four minutes. You want to cook them on both sides. And when they turn like nice and crispy and golden, um, especially around the edges, that's when they're ready. Simple. Well, we want to thank you so much for this. This has been on a personal note, so fulfilling. Dominic I'm Dominican, if you couldn't tell. And I, <laughs> and I am also very proud of my culture. So to see someone that is actively trying to pass down our culture, our heritage for future generations, it's so inspiring. Um, and thank you so much. Any last words? Thank you before, for having before me. Before we end, I feel like that's <laughs> <Before we end. laughs> Um Yeah, so... Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for the support. I hope that you guys had fun and that you enjoyed the recipe. Um, the book, the cookbook, The Dominican Kitchen is now available everywhere where books are sold. If you go to your local bookstore, thank you. If you go to your local bookstore um, and it's not available, you can ask them to um, you know, get it and carry it and they will order it. Um, but you know, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, um, Indigo, Anywhere uh, where you can buy a book, you should be able to find it. And I hope that, you know, you get it and that you try the recipes and that you enjoy it and that you take it and, and keep it as an heirloom for your family and pass it along and um, let's preserve these recipes. Amazing. Thank you so much, everyone.